actually i will take you back to july 13 which is observed as martyrs day in kashmir since 1931 and at the time also uh, before july 13 uh, the martyrs day uh, many shopkeepers alleged uh, and their representatives and leaders alleged that they were taken to a police station which is very close to lal chowk it's called kothi bag where uh, the uh, ssp srinagar and also sp east uh, they briefed them and also they alleged that they were threatened of dire consequences if they uh, you know kept their shops shut on the martyrs day or uh, and and the same thing has been repeated this time uh, and they have been called yesterday and they have been told uh, in no uncertain terms uh, there have been media reports uh, and also you know uh, on, on on the same thing that uh, they were told that the government does not want you to observe uh, hartal uh, the protest strike and uh, now uh, you have to uh, everything is normal and we will not allow anyone to observe hartal and if you do it there are consequences and then what happened uh, today that there were a lot of uh, photographs and video footage uh, uh, and a lot of tweets made by journalists and reporters who saw that uh, the markets in uh, the downtown area of Srinagar and also uh, in Lal Chowk uh, city center were closed but then immediately then the other videos emerged in which uh, police men uh, in uniform and without uniform were seen uh, breaking uh, you know the sh- shops open the locks open uh, using iron rods and the uh, shopkeepers alleged that this was being done uh, by the police and they were called uh to if you don't open we will uh, keep the shops open anyway uh so that's uh, the story so far it it's dystopian uh it's uh, i think uh, if george orwell would have been alive today uh, probably as one of our friends wrote recently he would have hanged himself because this is what uh you know he uh, imagined and envisioned in his uh, 1984 novel how a totalitarian state functions uh, and how there is this orwellian state where uh, you know the government actually wants to dictate to you what you should wear what you should eat and how you should behave and what is uh, be you know uh, how you should be happy how you should be sad so this is all uh, you know seems to be very orchestrated and uh, you know uh, to showcase and paint a uh, normalcy to sell the deceptive calm uh, of kashmir as the peace uh, you know as as peace and normalcy symbol and and it's strange in a way because after two years of continued um, uh, you know um, gags on media continued uh, you know um, stifling of dissent uh, arrests of political leaders across the ideological spectrum and also uh, you know taking many many youths uh, to prisons and then uh, you know forcing uh, local media owners and proprietors to to a particular line so despite that if uh, the police as is being alleged by the shopkeepers have to resort to such tactics after 2 years of you know enforced silence it speaks uh, of the situation that is prevalent in kashmir a it shows that uh, the piece of brave yards is no piece and second it shows that uh, kashmiris are democratic in behavior and they are very mature and they know when to uh, you know when to show their resentment peacefully and also see it also tells us that uh, you know no matter how much you stifle dissent no matter uh, how oppressive your um, uh, tactics are ultimately the mood on the street is defined uh, by the people on the street and uh, the sentiment on the street is that uh, whatever has happened on august 5 is unacceptable to the people of kargil to the people of peer panchal to the peer uh, to the people of the chenab valley to the people of jammu and to the people of the kashmir valley and and there have been similar protests uh, and similar uh, resentment in kargil uh, where many videos have also come up where even the bjp guys who had earlier celebrated uh, annexation of kashmir are now criticizing the government's decision Uh, so it it shows that uh, you know you can't uh, showcase you can't uh, paint normalcy with uh, uh, you know by using force uh, it it may uh, may have been a successful uh, you know kind of story for you to contain the kashmir story uh, by gagging the media and and by putting uh, politicians in the lockups but ultimately the mood on the street is that people have not accepted those decisions and and they want a dignified peaceful resolution 
and for that they are willing to uh, you know at times survive to tell the tale at at times preserve the memory document the ordeal and when the opportunity presents itself they also know how to uh, how to make their uh, sentiments and how to make their uh, political aspiration known uh, with a democratic and mature behavior we have to go back to 1931 and even before that when there was an agitation in uh, kashmir against the dogra autocratic uh, and uh, despotic uh, dogra regime and especially members of the minority community uh, the kashmiri pandits in special uh, who actually um, you know started an agitation when they felt threatened by the influence of uh, from the punjab region uh, which is now divided between india and pakistan and they thought that uh, their culture was under assault the kashmiri culture the kashmiri identity was under assault their jobs their employment opportunities their scholarships were under assault so they went with a representation to the dogra then maharaja hari singh and it's uh, the state subject law has actually its roots in 1927 so what 35a uh, meant was that it defined the permanent residents of jammu and kashmir Uh, so everybody had as the state subject uh, it's it's also called prc permanent residence certificate uh, and and it defined uh, the permanent residents of the entire region uh, which includes um, the plains of jammu and uh, the big chenab valley the peer panchal region and and the kashmir valley and also kargil and uh, areas like leh so once uh, this permanent resident was defined uh, then he or she was uh, entitled uh for employment for scholarship for jobs and for protection of land that no one else could buy land in kashmir so that way it became important article 30, 370 is uh, is different in a way because it defines the relationship which the unionist camp which is the pro india camp who uh, say that uh, the condition the conditional accession with the union of india was uh, conditional uh, because it said that once uh, you once the union of india uh, will take care of communication currency and foreign affairs but the rest of the things will be done by the people of jammu and kashmir by the uh, jammu and kashmir legislative assembly by the jammu and kashmir legislative council and their representatives and they will be uh, the masters of their dest- you know destiny and that's why you saw that kashmir had its own constitution kashmir had its own flag its own identity and its own laws under ranbir penal code not the ipc uh, so uh, it's it's for it's basically the argument being made by pro india political parties who are not satisfied with the status quo uh, like the pdp for example people's democratic party uh, which believes in self rule and it wants a resolution uh, wherein uh, the part that is under pakistan's administration which pakistan calls azad kashmir and which india calls uh, uh, refers to as pakistan occupied kashmir and similarly the this part uh, where i live in which is uh, f- from pakistan's point of view is indian occupied kashmir and from india's point of view is uh, you know indian kashmir so uh, the pdp believed that uh, the self rule uh, for both parts of divided kashmir uh, which is divided by a bloody line uh, line of control since 1948 49 uh, so uh, there should be no uh, you know kind of uh, problem as far as trade is concerned as far as uh, cultural and academic exchanges are concerned as far as the currency is concerned uh, in fact they also said that they were ready for a joint uh, you know india pakistan currency in both parts uh, and, and there should be demilitarization both the pakistani and indian troops should go away and let civilians uh meet and families because there are a lot of divided families and then there is national conference which also does not believe in the status quo and says that it's an unfinished agenda and uh, they actually want the status which existed uh, of jammu and kashmir in 1953 wherein kashmir jammu and kashmir would have its own prime minister called wazir azam and its own sadr e riyasat uh, which had the status of a president and then uh, uh, all its laws its own and its own constitution its own anthem song and and everything to be managed by the people of jammu and kashmir themselves um, and and then there is another camp which is a, a rival ideological camp which actually believes 
uh, that there is no solution is possible uh, under the ambit of Indian constitution and they want a resolution as promised by uh, late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru uh, which is of plebiscite wherein he took the matter to the UN United Nations Security Council where there are more than 18 resolutions on Kashmir and, and he said on record uh, on All India Radio and also in a speech, public speech in Lal Chowk where he reiterated his uh, commitment to the plebiscite and said once peace was restored in the region, uh, uh, the people of Jammu and Kashmir will be uh, given a choice to uh, choose their destiny, uh, either India or Pakistan, whatever. And and uh, th this this is uh, these are the broadly two camps which uh, want a solution either under the UN Charter UN uh, resolutions uh, or tripartite negotiated settlement and then there is other camp which wants to go back to 53 status 1953 status or self rule so that is like you know whether it's pro India or anti India or you know uh, it, they're both actually pro resolution nobody uh, is happy with the status quo so that is the broader theme. If you ask me as a Kashmiri and if you ask me as a journalist, there will be two separate answers, uh, which will not be markedly different from one another. But there's a difference in a sense that as a storyteller, I would tell you that how difficult it was for me because on the 4th of uh, August itself, uh, our phones, uh, internet connections got lost. There was no communication. There were no mobile phones and we could not even uh, talk to our families. We could not talk to our relatives, we could not talk to our friends and it was very difficult. The news gathering process became almost impossible because there was no way that you could reach out to someone via an email or an SMS or a WhatsApp or a, or a normal phone call. So they, those were horrible, horrible days how 5th August uh, is uh, in our memory as uh, one of the darkest days in terms of how civil liberties were suspended how dignity uh, was snatched and how also uh, rounds of humiliation and insult were served uh, to entire population by keeping them caged like animals uh, without rights. Uh, and, and if you ask me as a Kashmiri, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, uh, it was uh, kind of a, a demotion from being a second class citizen to being a slave, uh, you know, so to speak, that uh, they, they actually told you in un... Uh, no uncertain terms that this is the way that you have to live you have to accept and you we are uh, here to erase your memories we are here to make you forget uh, who you are what your language is what your religion is wh uh, what you wear uh, what you eat so now uh, you have uh, there's a new framework wherein we decide that who you are wherein we decide how to change your demography how to threaten your existence and how to actually uh, tell you uh, what to say and how to think uh, and how not to think. So this is uh, this is a challenge for every single uh, you know civilian uh, in Kashmir, every thinking uh, Kashmiri being uh, to uh, not actually forget and uh, to preserve the memory, to document the ordeal and and to keep a record of whatever is happening uh, under this regime. Uh, not that that uh, the picture was rosy earlier, but this is so brazen, uh, wherein. Uh, all rules of engagement uh, have been, uh, you know, kind of violated. Uh, it's it's so brazen that um, you 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 can't. Uh, but uh, you know, th there's no other way to describe that. It's a police state, and it's uh, the big brother is uh, you know doing everything, and uh, your life is so militarized. Uh, the the moment you move out of your house, uh, there is uh, this huge deployment of paramilitary and uh, local police and other Indian Army personnel. Uh, when, if you are on the highway and there's a convoy passing by, you have to wait for 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on how big the convoy is. And, and, and it gives you a feeling that you are being treated like a slave and it takes you back to the Holocaust literature, how the Jews would have uh, thought about themselves when they were under the Nazi regime and how they were made to wear yellow crosses and how they were not allowed to move out uh, on the highways or to do shopping or to visit synagogues. Uh, at particular timings and uh, how they were marked and how the surveillance was so much that every single Jew was marked and when they were taken to the concentration camps and the tat uh, you know the, the, the tattoos were made on their bodies to uh, identify them not by their name but by the tattoo number 
so uh, it, it's it's uh, it's a very very dark situation uh, it has been one of the darkest uh, era these last 7 years and especially since last 2 years but of course the kashmir story is does not start with august 5 and it it did not start with may 2014 when the current regime took over in india uh, it it's a story of 70 years uh, you know 75 years and even before that if you go back to the dogra era or the mughal era or the sikh era and it's been like you know if you go back to uh, when mohammad yusuf yusuf shah chak uh, the independent uh, kashmir's uh, king yusuf shah chak was tricked by the mughal emperor akbar and then uh, taken to delhi and then imprisoned and he is currently buried in bihar so it's a, it's a tale of tragedies uh, so you know um, um, but but specifically uh, i gave you answers on august 5 as a journalist and also as a kashmiri ah uh, to be honest i think uh, to be a journalist in kashmir has never been a cake walk um, it has never been easy uh, we hear from our seniors uh, who have seen the 90s the era of the 90s when they say that uh, there was so much of pressure from both the state and non state actors at the time uh, that uh, even when the government sponsored gunmen called the ikhwan or the nawabid in uh, you know local parlance how they would kidnap editors and make them toe their line and make them publish their statements on the front page and and the, many were shot and many were kidnapped brutalized humiliated and and uh, but uh, what happened in uh, from may 2014 and especially since august 5 that uh, this has been so brazen as i said earlier that um, you know before uh, what you mentioned about my case i'll tell you that uh, i had to uh, reach when i had to rejoin to chavela as an editor in uh, august uh, 2018 uh, 2019 after my book uh, rage and reason was published on the july 20 uh, july 17th uh, that year so i was at the airport uh, it was uh, i still remember um, you know it was the uh, intervening night of august 31st uh, and september 1 and uh, when i was stopped at the immigration bureau and it was the, for the first time that i faced uh, such because i have been a widely traveled journalist and i had no idea that why they were stopping me and and uh, that was like you know when 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 they stopped me from traveling abroad or when they uh, you know almost snatched my livelihood uh, my job and then in april 2020 last year when uh, when i heard from uh, my friend that there is a statement uh, and and it mentions my name and then you know there's this case under uap and before me there was masrat zaira and my other colleagues like uh, peer zada ashik who works for the hindu or nasir ganai who works for the outlook uh, he had a case in february and then before that there were many others who were summoned one by one including irfan hakim of the economic times uh, basharat p you know uh, uh, basharat masood of the indian express and uh, akib javed who is a freelance journalist and also uh, writes for article 14 and the wire and and many other journalists like fahad shah and um, you know kazi shibli from south kashmir you know many many i think more than uh, 23 uh, journalists uh, including male and female who were summoned and cases uh, registered against uh, you know many um, and and so it became a routine that uh, this is now going to be very very difficult uh, uh, to document to to preserve and and it has actually what it has done is it uh, i'll not say that it's it's been uh, you know you, uh, you can actually shower praises on yourself but that's not the point uh, i think uh, they have managed to silence media um, to a large extent especially the local media uh, by by summoning the editors or the proprietors or owners or the managing editors to delhi by an external agency and what has uh, that meant is uh, that uh, the newspapers did not publish any editorials they did not publish any op-ed pages uh, and even when they did uh, after months uh, of silence and the the articles were on congo the situation in congo the articles were, were on how to treat diabetes how to make salad how cucumber was good for health and and that's that that also showed that how much oppression was there how much pressure they also faced and then or some of the media uh, you know bodies and media houses actually decided to become the uh, extension arm of the government which happens you know even in india like you see uh, there is the public tv there is times now but there is also the wire or, or there is also the quint or you know other caravan for example so uh, that uh, you know most of the uh, journalists uh, you know owners Uh, who they succumbed under pressure uh, because they were summoned threatened and they had a lot of stakes 
so they decided to become the extension arm of the government and in return they received a lot of advert advertisements which happens with z and aaj tak so similar thing happened with them they became richer uh, but uh, the ent- actual pressure has been and is continues to be on the individual journalists who report either for international media or for who work as independent journalists and who work for various uh, portals inside india for the wire for the quint scroll caravan or you know other uh, you know uh, publications who still have the uh, you know courage and who still um, gather courage or summon courage or have the fire in the belly to report truth so uh, most of the pressure is on them those journalists who actually do not want to make any compromise uh, uh, with their professional integrity uh, so it's been very difficult uh, and it has also resulted in self censorship if you see how people now talk about the situation uh, using poetry using satire using humor and using uh, like you know there's a lot of uh, fiction uh, writing now in in a sense that uh, when you talk about kashmir you actually give examples from other part of the world so that you're not uh, at the uh, you know receiving end so it's it's uh, it's very difficult to be a journalist in kashmir and um, i think uh, it entails uh, you know w- you know there are two things uh, one is that there's a moral responsibility as a journalist to document uh and and to tell the story to preserve memory and and to reflect uh, in your reports in your videos in your uh, writings uh, what the ground situation is uh, but uh, this moral responsibility also entails uh, a cost and it has consequences so uh, that is uh, that is that is the you know crux about it I think you know if I take you back to 2008 or when uh, there was a transition in Kashmir from uh, so to speak from a violent uh, you know kind of expression to a non-violent and peaceful expression in the shape of uh, large scale demonstrations large scale protests uh, agitation civilian agitation in which uh, you know millions of people came on the roads Uh, from Eidgah to Lal Chowk, uh, in the stretch of eight kilometers, people were on the roads demanding uh, their political aspirations in a peaceful manner and actually making human chains uh, to protect uh, the men in the uniform and asking every single participant, every single protester, not to, uh, you know, raise any provocative slogan or not to hurl a stone. Uh, and and then uh, what happened when the newspapers reported uh, these uh, uh, you know agitations in 2008 2009 uh, after the rape uh, alleged rape and murder of uh, Nilofar and Asya in Shopian in South Kashmir and 2010 uh, so in these three successive uh, you know kind of agitations uh, civilian agitations more than uh, i think uh, 200 boys more than 200 120 in 2010 64 in 2008 and uh, again some 50 odd in uh, you know um, uh, 2009 so these are not just statis- statistics these are not numbers these are real people with real names like tufail muttu with real names like wamik farooq uh, you know uh, people who faced brutality and were killed either uh, through uh, with uh, the tear gas shells or the bullets or the pellets so when this was being reported by the media the local media at the time mr chidambaram was india's home minister and uh, you know the editors tell us that they were uh, the advertisements were withdrawn the advertisements to various newspapers including the kashmir times and at the time greater kashmir and also the rising kashmir and other newspapers were stopped or partially stopped and or or you know completely stopped and uh, they were accused of um, publishing coat and coat a separatist content and uh, then they were asked to toe a line and not to report what was being uh, happening on the streets of kashmir so it was always the pressure was always there and 2016 saw uh, a kind of uh, you know there was this uh, paradigm shift where uh, as as i said that uh, there are some unwritten rules in a conflict so all unwritten rules of engagement were kind of uh, violated when uh, an english uh, newspaper based in uh, kashmir valley uh, called kashmir reader it was completely stopped by the pdp and bjp government uh, and uh, its editors were taken away and uh, the newspaper could not uh, publish itself and there was a government order through which it, its publication was stopped uh, so uh, the uh, the stage was set already in 2008 2009 10 and 
and what this government actually did is that uh, they are so brazen i mean they don't mind uh, the uh, international condemnation they don't mind how uh, the freedom house report uh, uh, you know relegated actually india's stature uh, from being uh, you know free to partly free or how the vidam institute called it electoral autocracy and uh, uh, you know how amnesty international or human rights watch or other international watchdogs uh, you know or or how the scathing editorials came up in washington post or guardian or the new york times uh, i mean they don't care about these things i think uh, you know when somebody is uh, you know kind of high on ideological weed and and with a hindutva mindset uh, which is not only expansionist in nature but which also has a civilizational idea about largely about muslims in india and also muslims in kashmir uh, so uh, no they have this civilizational view that uh, any muslim who can speak well who can read and write letters and who has an opinion who can think uh, and act independently or is economically sound so they want to uh, show him or her uh, you know his and her place and to you know uh, kind of dispossess and disempower them and and uh, humiliate them so that is uh, that is what is new in this government they do things uh, without any nuance they do things brazenly while as the previous governments uh, would do certain things you know uh, kind of keeping a smoke screen or a facade of any democratic behavior so that is that, uh, that, that that's what i uh, want to differentiate between the two Uh, see uh, i'll tell you that as a storyteller when we go to cover these uh, alleged uh, atrocities and violations that take place every single day uh, especially in the rural parts of kashmir you mentioned some of the cases and there have been also extrajudicial killings you know uh, and some of them widely reported like the pathribal uh, encounter in which five innocent laborers were killed and later dubbed as uh, foreign mercenaries or terrorists and similarly the machil encounter in 2000 Uh, 10 uh, when uh, the, the previous case patribal was in uh, march 20 uh, 2000 and then the 2010 when umar abdullah was uh, at the helm of affairs again the civilians were uh, you know killed and passed off as militants or terrorists and then uh, you had uh, a late, latest case where from where uh, you know the, you had these boys from ship uh, from rajouri uh, area in the peer panchal who came uh, to uh, kashmir's shupanya for work and uh, you know then they got all of them got killed and and even the you know indian army spokesperson uh, and a colonel ranked officer actually gave minute by minute details of that alleged encounter and said uh, you know how, how how much arms and ammunition were recovered and how the cordon was laid and how the uh, firing took place when nothing of that sort had happened these were innocent laborers and later their uh, you know families um, uh you know uh, raised voice and then uh, the dna testing was done and their bodies were returned and they were all innocents uh and and civilians so these uh, beat the extrajudicial killings or be it the problem of the mass graves or be it the problem of the custodial disappearances or you mentioned about kunan bosh pora or asia nilo for case in shopaya which is uh, the double murder and rape case or the gang rape uh, mass rape in kunan bosh pora two twin villages in kupwara and other place and the daily daily humiliation that is being served uh, to an ordinary kashmiri uh, you know while checking his or her identity card and you know and and uh, you know or you talked about the raising of houses uh, and and uh, there are other, other allegations that people now make uh, a lot of women have alleged that uh, during encounters their houses are raised raided and then all the jewelry and whatever cash is there the belongings have been taken and there are many reports actually been filed on this and when the newspapers uh, or the portals filed these reports actually the cases were uh, you know uh, uh, slapped against the uh, <coughs> newspaper owners and newspaper reporters for reporting uh, you know what what the local people had uh, said so when when you talk to people i think they they say four words they repeat one is that we will never forgive and we will never forget and second is they say that it's a battle between memory and forgetfulness uh, what they have done to us uh, you know we may be silent now uh, we we may not be reacting in anger there's no angry reaction but kashmiris a uh, lot of kashmiris believe that uh, their time will come and they will have their tungsten moment and uh, when the time and opportunity presents itself they will uh, give a mature response and when they are allowed to speak 
uh, and even the politicians you know political class across the board you see the protests today uh, the pdp uh, leader mahbub mufti took out and marked august 5 as a black day uh, the jammu kashmir uh, national conference leaders put out the flag the jnk's own flag uh, as a mark of protest uh, to uh, you know kind of showcase their identity and there is this pagd people's alliance for gupka declaration which terms august 5 as uh, as as an act of war and and says that nothing about us without us so that's one camp and the other camp i said that uh, they are mostly silent because all of them are mostly uh, in in jails incarcerated and they're not allowed to speak and uh, there's this long silence but silence uh, does not mean surrender so i will stop at that thank you very much